This lecture will focus on the effects of the Great Depression. These are the overall effects of the Great Depression and Hoover's initial response to it. So just a reminder, some of the causes of the Great Depression were stock speculation, banks closing, especially run on the banks where Americans would go and try to withdraw all their money from the banks, thus causing the banks to run out of money and close, farm failures, and of course the Dust Bowl. So if we look at the overall effects of the Great Depression on Americans, let's start with families. Families stood as a source of strength, traditional values, and the importance of family unity. So when you're talking about the leisure time of the 1920s, instead of going to see the movies or going out to plays and things like that, instead families stayed home and played board games or listened to the radio. Only a few families broke under the strain of the Depression. Men had difficulty coping with unemployment. They were supposed to be the breadwinners. Some became hobos. Hitching rides on plane, railroad cars or sleeping under the bridges looking for work. When it came to women, women managed the daily household budget and made ends meet. Some were resenting for holding jobs outside the home. Remember, women were willing to work for less than men, and so often they were paid less than men and more likely to be hired. Children seriously su suffered from serious health problems from a poor diet and lack of health care. Schools closed and thousands of children went to work instead of to school. So there were some social and psychological effects as well. They were demoralized by hard times. Some lost their will to survive. The suicide rate rose by 30%. Others made sacrifices. They went without health care, a college education, or getting married. The stigma of poverty and surviving never went away. One major goal in my life was that was never to be poor again. This was a common thread for those who survived the Great Depression. Also, at the same time, there was this pattern of kindness and generosity. Many Americans donated and provided for those who had lost everything. It was often known that if you were a hobo and going through town, there were places that you could go where people would share their last loaf of bread with you, or they would employ you in some basic work in order to give you an opportunity to keep going. Many people developed the skills of thriftiness and saving in that idea of being determined never to um, be poor again. So let's look at the government's response. The first response was to try to protect American industry, and they did this with the Holly Smoot Tariff, or sometimes the Smoot Holly Tariff. In 1930, this was the highest protective tariff in American history. It was designed to protect American farmers and manufacturers from foreign competition. However, by reducing the flow of trade into the country, it also limited the amount of U.S. currency Europeans had to buy U.S. goods. Then, Europeans often responded with their own tariffs. And so you saw worldwide trade fall by 40%. You also have to remember, Europeans have been engaged in a depression during the 1920s. So by the 1930s, they do not have a lot of money to buy our goods. So Americans were pretty much on their own. Hoover was president at the time, and he had the philosophy of rugged individualism. People should succeed by their own efforts. A lot of Americans agreed with him. A lot of Americans felt that they should survive by their own efforts. And they felt demoralized by the fact that they could not. He believed in relying on volunteerism. Rather than federal welfare or direct relief to the needy, he felt the federal government should negotiate cooperation between businesses and corporations and the people, and that it should really be people relying on local charities and local charities providing the relief. Unfortunately, volunteerism is not going to work very well, mostly because people were having trouble. It was just too big for volunteerism or rugged individualism to respond. So a lot of Americans felt that their president were, wasn't responding to the problem. And so we had a lot of nicknames, Hoovervilles, which were shanty towns, Hoover blankets, which were newspapers, Hoover flags, empty pockets that were hanging out. Those were all these nicknames. And after a while, President Hoover felt that strain that his people did not feel that he was responding. So he's going to reverse his course and implement some reform. One of those is the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation was the idea of trickle-down economics. The government loaned money to railroads, large businesses, and banks. The idea that they would be able to employ people and they'd be able to make further loans. And that this money would trickle down to the masses because by keeping the economy going with these big businesses, with these banks, and then smaller businesses relying on the banks, that by peop keeping people employed, people would be able to have money to be able to spend, which would re-stimulate the economy. This was an effort. It was too far. 
the economy had fallen too far down in order for this to work. But it was an effort, and it did help stimulate the economy a little bit. Um, the Hoover Dam is another example. Um, though this was passed by Congress right before Hoover took office, he will continue to fund it, and it become it was originally Boulder Dam. It will later become the Hoover Dam, and it created a lot of employment to the Southwest, which is where FDR will start to get his ideas about the public works programs. By employing people in works for the federal government, that will create jobs, which will give them money, which means that they will be able to have money to spend to help stimulate the economy rather than the loans. The biggest problem during Hoover's administration was the bonus army. This took place towards the end of his administration in 1932. 10 to 20,000 World War I veterans and their families marched on the Capitol demanding an immediate payment of a bonus due them in 1945. The federal government said, we're going to give you a bonus for serving in World War I. You get it in 1945. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're starving now. We need that money now. Hoover was sympathetic, but he was opposed to the legislation. He allowed them to peaceably assemble, provided food and supplies so they could build a shanty town on Washington in front of the Capitol. But when the, bill was, when the bill was voted down, when Congress wouldn't fund the bonuses, Hoover asked them to leave. And this is an example of them on the Capitol, all waiting, trying to petition government to support this. So July 28, 1932, Hoover ordered the troops to disband the bonus army. General Douglas MacArthur and his assistant, Major Dwight D. Eisenhower, those names should be familiar, you'll hear them a lot in our next unit, led 1,000 troops in. They used tear gas to disperse the people. An 11-month-old baby and it, uh, died. An 8-year-old boy was blinded. Two people were shot and many were injured. Most Americans were outraged at the treatment of the bonus army. A lot of Americans didn't agree that the bonus army should get their, their bonuses at this time, but it's really difficult when the army attacks veterans and their families and children die. When Roosevelt heard the news, he stated, this will elect me. And that's where we'll be going in our next lecture. We'll be focusing on FDR's election and his first 100 days in office, where he's going to create a lot of public works in order to try to create change and end the Great Depression. So the next lecture will be on the New Deal.